I'm here to talk to you today because I think we do, and everybody in this room knows we do, a lousy job of looking after the frail elderly. Um, I suspect, now you may not agree with the things I have to say, but I suspect that I'm preaching to the choir here. But the reality is that we're just not making the progress that I think we should be making, that I think we need to make. There are real good reasons for that, I'm sure, but I don't know whether I can tell you what they are. What I want to say to you is, you know, as if you didn't know, this is what the frail elderly are, this is what they look like, this is what the medical system is and what it does. They don't fit together very well, the two of them, the frail elderly and the healthcare system as we have it in 2011. And then I want to try and get at, in the last few minutes, a little bit of what we can do about that. I think the solution is starting. I can see it starting. And I'll bet that's true for many of you as well. But I think we've got a long way to go. How many people here work in facilities? How many people here work in the community? Brilliant, it's about 50-50 majority of facility. It doesn't make any difference. We're dealing with the same people, you know. There's one at home. Now, you know, a picture, in my mind, is worth a thousand words. And when we talk about what a frail elderly person is, everybody in this room has a picture in their mind. I'm going to show you three or four pictures because one of the points I want to make is that the frail elderly have common characteristics, but they're all very different from one another. So here's a lady whose obsessive compulsiveness makes my wife look relaxed. Uh, this, this is not my wife. <laughs> this lady refuses to have her obvious infection of cellulitis in her legs treated. She refuses to allow me to cut the corns and calluses on her feet so that she can walk comfortably. She insists on all sorts of strange uh, behaviors and she will not take medication. Uh, but she's happy. This is a happy person, and I have no idea why. I mean, she's not doing anything that I'm telling her next slide. This lady is worth $35 million. She lives in a seven-bedroom mansion on half an acre in Shaughnessy. She has a full-time staff of three. She has an indoor swimming pool. She can't get out of her home because of really, really bad chronic obstructive lung disease. And there she is sitting in her favorite chair, also not an unhappy person. The people I really deal with are not her, but her two sons, who are always there when I visit her. And they're out in the wings wringing their hands like this and walking back and forth. And for some reason I wonder what it is they really mean when, when I'm finished. Seeing the lady, they come up to me and they say, Doc, how is she? <laughs> I saw this man for the first time the day I took this picture. He doesn't speak any English. My Cantonese is rusty. Okay? We didn't communicate very well. Um, he was able to focus attention. He had an irregular heart rate of about 70 beats per minute. He had a blood pressure. He wasn't in obvious distress. I made an appointment to see him a week later. Four days after I took this picture, he died. He lives in the middle, or lived in the middle of Vancouver, sort of out toward the east part of town in a tiny little bungalow. Very different from the $35 million lady, very much the same as her, in that what he needs is not what the health care has to offer, because he's frail. The walls of academia are papered with four-eyed definitions of frailty. I'm sure there are people 
university professors in this room who could tell me four or five of them. There's a guy in the Maritimes who's known all over the world for having defined frailty in seven categories. I'm sorry. For me, this is the definition you need. Okay, it's dependence for ADL, for dressing and eating and walking and using a toilet and bathing and banking and food prep and transport and all of that kind of stuff. You can't do it because of something the matter with you and so you need somebody else to do it for you. So you're dependent. All right, now we reach the issue of exactly where you draw the line under which ADL you draw the line in terms of who's frail and who isn't. And I have the answer to that question, which I'm going to tell you in a second if I remember to. But another important aspect of frailty is that it's irremediable. So the lower extremity dysfunction, the memory problems, the cognitive impairment that you've got that causes you to require somebody to assist you with these things is not something that somebody can fix. It's not because you're depressed and you could be on medication or because you need socialization or because you need a better wheelchair or because you uh, have just been to a cardiologist and been put on a bunch of stupid medication or something else that we can fix. It's irremediable. Somebody competent has looked at your frailty, tried to fix it, and shown that it can't be fixed. And so there you are. Once you are irremediably dependent, you go through a door, you become a frail person, and then at some point, something very important happens. I have a daughter in Toronto who's in advertising, bless her heart, and I was talking to her one night after a couple of glasses of wine about why nobody is listening to me about the frail elderly. And she listened, and then she said, Dad, you're going to brand them. <laughs> and so on that occasion, we cooked up the term sunshiners, because these people need to be in the sunshine. Now, I'm not saying that that's the most original or the most interesting or the most appropriate brand for the kind of frail elderly I'm talking about in the world, but it's the one I'm using. And they have specific characteristics. They are a subgroup within frailty. They're all irremediably dependent for ADL, but they have decided certain things. I don't want to be a burden on the people I love. I care more about comfort than I care about prolonging life. I don't want to be on medication unless I have to. I don't want to go to the hospital unless I have to. And there's a big group of those people, and you've probably met a bunch of them. And I call them sunshiners. They're very special people, and I think they are the majority of the frail. They are people who have made a critical decision about their future. And that critical decision embodies those values in the last slide. Don't get me wrong. I think modern healthcare is fantastic. When I have my myocardial infarction, I want them there in five minutes. I want to be in the ER. I want the hemodynamic support. I want the operation for my dissected aorta. I want the the very best available for my brain tumor. I want all that modern healthcare has to offer if I can benefit from it. So I want to just say something about what I think modern healthcare's priorities are and see what you think about that. Priority number one is prevention. We don't treat illness anymore, we prevent it. And we talk about lifestyle, we talk about smoking cessation, and we talk about diet. And it's just so much hot air, because prevention, where modern healthcare is concerned, consists of taking medication. It really does. Okay? Look at prevention for stroke, look at prevention for worsening of type 2 diabetes, look at prevention of admission for heart failure, prevention of myocardial infarction, prevention of all of those conditions that we used to treat in order to make people feel better, Medication is involved. We're talking about drugs. Okay? So priority number one is prevention with medication. Occasionally, we fail to prevent the catastrophe. And when we fail to prevent the catastrophe, of course, we rush in effectively and we pick up the pieces. And that's priority number two. I call it rescue. 
And you know what rescue is. It's critical care. It starts when you push the 911 panic button and it ends, well, you know, somewhere in the middle of a hospital. So we're talking about prevention and rescue, which is where we put our efforts and our energy and what we're real good at in modern healthcare. The issue, however, is our patients, you know, the people I see at home because they can't get out to see a doctor, the people you see in facilities and you see in the community, are these priorities beneficial to them? Uh, I think you know what my answer is going to be, but let me go through it for you. First of all, uh, and believe me, I'm in the minority among my colleagues in believing this, prevention doesn't work in frailty. I don't think prevention necessarily works at all, frankly. But boy, does it ever not work in the elderly. I think there's four great reasons why not. The first one has to do with a principle of geriatrics and gerontology which is referred to as heterogeneity. And heterogeneity just means that they're all different from one another in all sorts of different ways. And you know what that means. Every single one of these people is odd. Right? They're, you know, they're, they're trolls in, in, in a sense. Funny, little, funny, big, funny, strange, funny, old people. They just all are. The scatter is all over the map. The bell curve is very flat. And here's the example. Creatinine clearance, you know, is kidney function on the, on the axis going up and down. And then age is along the bottom. And that first little line is a 20-year-old. And that's the two standard deviations of their kidney function. In other words, at 20, your kidney function is predictable. The bigger line on your right is an 88-year-old. And that's a very wide range of kidney function because the frail elderly are heterogeneous with respect to kidney function. They are heterogeneous, folks, with respect to everything that goes to determine what happens when you give an elderly person a drug. What that means is that because they are heterogeneous with respect to their body fat and body water, the avidity with which the receptor sites grab onto the drugs, the amount, of protein they have in their system, the rapidity with which they discharge medications in their kidneys and detoxify them in their liver and so forth. The main thing that I teach residents when I get my hands on them about prescribing for the frail elderly is you give a frail elderly person a drug, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen because they are heterogeneous and so they are unpredictable. Prevention is a statement about the future. You take this aspirin, you will not have a myocardial infarction, or you will have your myocardial infarction later. It's a statement, it's a prediction about the future. Guess what? You can't predict in somebody who's unpredictable with respect to medication, and that is absurdity of prevention and frailty number one. Um, second principle of gerontology that you all know very well is called multiple pathology. And of course we know there are sick babies and we've all met well 92 year olds. But unfortunately the sad truth is that on the average as you get older you get sicker, you accumulate illnesses. I have a part time job with an outfit called Quorum out of Seattle. And Quorum is an independent review board that looks at drug trials for drug industry. And so once a week, we get a, a raft, this board that I sit on, of drug trials to review to make sure that they are ethically sound. And that's what Quorum gets paid its money for. The fascinating thing, one of many fascinating things I found out through that job, is that exclusion criteria for absolutely every single randomized controlled trial that's ever done in the United States according to the Food and Drug Administration in Canada, according to Health Canada, in Germany, in Italy, in France, all the Western countries, according to their 
um, agencies that look after this kind of thing cannot include anybody with anything the matter with them except the disease that's being studied. You smoke cigarettes, you're not in the trial. You have diabetes, you're not in the trial. You've ever been in congestive heart failure, you're out of the trial. You've got a little bit of Alzheimer's, you're out of the trial. You drink alcohol, you're not in the trial. Okay? And so the reality is, no frail elderly people are ever in. The only trials that ever go to show that prevention works. It's kind of interesting to me to consider the idea that if you take a preventive medication, you absolutely never know, nobody ever knows, whether it works. Your future rolls out, you have your heart attack or you don't, you have your stroke or you don't, you fall and fracture or you don't. What would have happened if you hadn't taken the medication? You never know because each of us is not a controlled experiment. So the only evidence that proves that prevention works with drugs is randomized controlled trials. You can't do studies of prevention in frailty because there's never any frail elderly in the trials. Absurdity of prevention in frailty number two. 92 year old lady goes to her doctor. He says, you've got thin bones, Margaret. I want to give you bisphosphonates, which you know is the treatment for osteoporosis. And Margaret says, uh, because she has the presence of mind at this particular occasion, which she rarely does, uh, Doctor, how long will it take to work? Doctor has a blank look on his face. He pulls out his computer, he types it up, and he starts looking. And he eventually finds the answer, which is two to three years, approximately, Margaret. Margaret says, I'll see you next week, goes home, fires up her computer, looks at the Canada Life Tables and recognizes that her life expectancy is approximately two to three years. <laughs> you know, so she's unlikely to benefit. Heterogeneity not only affects the good things that happen with drugs, it affects the bad things that happen with drugs. And another principle of geriatrics and gerontology is atypical presentation of everything, and that includes drug side effects. And so elderly people who experience hypotension from their beta blockers and who experience uh, some esophageal problems from their bisphosphonates, and on and on and on, they present atypically. And what we get, you nurses, we doctors, pharmacists, physiotherapists, social workers, family members, is, gee, I'm just not feeling that great. Or nothing at all, but just a kind of a grinding down in function. And so there's enhanced danger to these people, enhanced danger of taking medications. And that's absurdity in prevention number four. I'm here to tell you the frail elderly live in an evidence-free zone. And so priority of health care number one, which is prevention, doesn't work in the frail elderly. Um, like it or not, it's just the truth. Priority number two, rescue. There are the guys at 9-11. And boy, are they ever involved in rescue. But what about that's a different kind of rescue. I use the slide for obvious reasons, just to kind of try and keep you awake here. What about the frail elderly? We've got to talk a little bit about what happens to them. The relationship between ADL ability and illness is not linear. And I call this the slippery slope because as capability deteriorates, sorry, as illness increases, capability deteriorates faster. Okay. The band on the left, right up there, that's me on a given morning. I can't fly a 747, I can't run a 10 second 100, but I can work a 16 hour day, you know. I'm relatively capable at ADL. That little increment, that stripe, is an increment of illness, which you see along the bottom axis there. Let's call it the flu. So if you move a little bit to the right to the second line there, I wake up in the morning with the flu. And if you go back to capability, you can see that I, and I'm sure all of us in this room, with a little bit of an increment of illness, don't suffer all that great a diminution of our capability. 
they can still function, you know. Further over on your right, the left-hand line is Mary McCarthy, age 88, you know, just my favorite typical name of an elderly person. And there she is along the capability axis. She is a little bit mobility impaired, and she's a little bit cognitively impaired. And she's slow, and she takes a bunch of... She's got some problems with ADL function. And that stripe is the same width. So we give Mary McCarthy the flu on a given morning, and what you see there is that the, the, there is a marked diminution in her capability. She suffers much more loss of ADL ability than any of us would with exactly the same increment of illness, and that is the consequence of the slippery slope, of the nonlinear relationship between capability and illness. The natural history of frailty. My wife tells me, John, don't show this slide. You know, this, this is not a nice slide to show. It's, it's the life's a bitch. <laughs> then you die slide, you know. There, there it is. There. And, and yet, and yet, I mean, nobody doubts that this is the truth. Once you're frail, once you're 92, and you've got chronic obstructive lung disease and Parkinson's disease and angina, congestive heart failure, diabetes, and all the medications and all the rest of it, you're not getting better you're getting worse. However, this is the real natural history of frailty. Oh yes, you're on your way down to the terminal point there at the bottom, but you don't go there in a straight line. You go there through crisis and deterioration, a little bit of recovery, a little bit of deterioration, and that is the consequence of the slippery slope. Mary McCarthy is banging back and forth up and down the slippery slope with relatively trivial changes in her health status but major changes in her function. And so, crisis in frailty is different from the kind of crisis that the healthcare system is set up to deal with. The healthcare system is set up to deal with a 18-month-old with meningitis, with a 50-year-old who has crushing retrosternal chest pain, with a 40-year-old who has had a mangling injury in a factory, with a person who has fallen and fractured their skull, with these crises, which are catastrophic, and which everybody knows of, and motor vehicle accidents, that kind of stuff. But crisis in frailty consists of that little change in health status, big change in functional status. The little change in health status is usually trivial stuff. It's the flu. It's soft tissue injury. It's I went to the cardiologist and got put on a bunch of stupid medications. Its daughter went out of town. You know, its son-in-law got drunk and we had to stay up all night. All that kind of ordinary dull stuff. But this is what I hear when that happens. You know, it doesn't matter if the person's at home or whether she's in a facility. She can't get down for meals. You know, the wheels have fallen off, as the geriatricians say and we can't cope. That's the bottom line. The important thing, from the point of view of crisis, is not that the elderly person can't walk now, important though that is, it's that we can't cope. Because caregiving is so critical. And that's what crisis in frailty is all about. What do we do about crisis in frailty? We have no choice. You call the family physician, you get a recording saying go to the emergency room. You call the home care nurse, you get a recording saying call in the morning, usually. Okay. So what does the, the caregiver, who knows from nothing about what's wrong, the old lady is confused now, she can't walk now, she fell and hurt her backside, she blah, blah, she's got diarrhea, whatever it is, she pushed the 911 panic button. Now, we're in Richmond here, and I think the same thing happens here as happens in Vancouver when you push the 911 panic button. You don't get an ambulance. You get two fire trucks, and you get them in four minutes. And they block the road. And the next thing you know, you've got to direct the traffic. There's some kind of a panic situation going on. And pretty soon after that, you need reinforcements. And the next thing you know, things get out of hand. And 
it's, I mean, it's a lot of expense, it's a lot of noise, it's a lot of running around, it always happens in the middle of the night, and this is where we end up, because it's the only light on in town at 3 o'clock in the morning in the healthcare system, as we have it. And there it is, you know, and this is an elderly person who has influenza A, or who has a bad cold, or who's fallen and hurt her backside, or who's on some stupid medications of the cardiac, you know, this is not an emergency room, high-tech, needs-to-be-rescued kind of situation. And so here's the old guy, in a merge, lying in the hallway, Richmond General Hospital, 3 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock the next morning, 3 o'clock the morning after that. And this is the composite story. Gets admitted to medicine because he can't walk and nobody knows what's wrong. He's treated with antibiotics. He's confused and noisy by day three. Guess why? You know, there's seven reasons why he's in delirium. He gets diarrhea on day four, which is the inevitable consequence of antibiotics in the hospital, antibiotics being the inevitable consequence of going into the hospital. He climbs over the side rail. He fractures his humerus. So what do we do? Well, we call the specialist. He's got chest pain, we call cardiology. He's got a headache, we call neurology. He can't get out of bed, we call rheumatology. He uh, starts to freak out and scream and yell, we call geriatric psychiatry. He um, starts to have a wound, we call a special nurse in the hospital. He has other problems with swallowing, we call an occupational therapist, etc., etc. He gets put on medications because these people in the hospital follow guidelines. We wonder why he can't talk and why his blood pressure is low by day 18. Uh, hint, it's medication. Maybe, plus or minus some other things, the family sits down with the ethicist and the other people in the hospital and makes the perfectly sensible decision that intensive care is a bad idea for this guy. And he dies on week three. Typical hospital admission. Now, there are people who get out of the hospital alive, you know. You've seen this happen. <laughs> but we talk about circling the drain, and there is, in fact, a vicious cycle that goes on. You're on drugs, as a result of which you don't function as well, as a result of which you land in the hospital, as a result of which you're on more drugs, etc. And around it goes. You go to the literature. You try to find out what predicts hospital admission, and it's all this stuff. What do you think? You know, it's, it's biopsychosocial crap all of that happens to people. You know, bad thing A, bad thing B, bad thing C, all predicts hospital admission. There are things that predict staying out of the hospital, and they have, you know, to do with going and seeing the people at home, and paying a little bit of individual attention to and then you go to the literature and look at whether hospitals actually help in terms of outcome. And the answer is and oh, <laughs> time after time after time with frail elderly people. Okay? And I, you know, after that kind of academic exercise, I find myself throwing up my hands and saying, listen, tell me something I don't know. Frailer and sicker, likelier to go to the hospital, looked after properly at home and supported, less likely to go to the hospital. Hospital doesn't fix anything. Holy smoke, you know? So that's rescue and where it goes in the frail elderly. This lady is fascinating. Um, she's dead now, um, which, you know, I. I the College of Physicians and Surgeons wants me to ask her if it's okay to use her picture in a presentation like this. It's not the easiest thing in the world to do. <laughs> Fascinating woman, 92 years old, uh, weight in pounds approximately equal to her age, capable of getting from her bed to the toilet with her walker in her tiny apartment, PhD in Russian literature, brilliant woman, cognitively intact full of ironic sense of humor, wanted to talk about Chekhov and philosophy and poetry and so on with me. And all I wanted to do is take her thyroid medication, you know? And I'm in a hurry. And she wants to talk and talk and she wants to talk. And I, I said, look, come on, just 
won't you just take your pills? This is my Oscar. And she says, Doctor, look, I, pills, I don't need pills. What I need, and this is after a 20 minute conversation, I'm just jumping up and down to get out the door and go and see my next victim. What I need is a little switch of the side of my bed, which when I throw it, I don't wake up in the morning. <gasps> And I, I look at my watch and I'm thinking, okay, there's another half hour now that I gotta, I gotta spend with this lady. So I start talking to her about that. This is the problem, doctor. I think that I'm going to be in pain in the future, I'm gonna be short of breath in the future, and you're not gonna know how to fix it. My daughter comes in at five o'clock. The other day, I had a little bit of diarrhea. I didn't make it to the bathroom. I saw the look on her face when she was cleaning it up and I don't want her to hate me. I was in the hospital six months ago, and oh my God, I'm never going back there again. There's great reasons for me to throw the night switch. And I'm thinking, oh my God, this is passive suicide. What am I going to do here? I've got, to, I've got to ask the right questions. And so the questions I ask her are, what would it take what would it take to make you want to see the next day or two or three? And this is what she tells me. You promise you can keep me comfortable. Well, at least give me an indication that you're going to try to keep me comfortable. You keep me functioning. In other words, make sure that whatever you do contributes to me being able to still get to the bathroom and back. You don't abandon me, which means you don't send me to the emergency room every time I sneeze and you're available for me in the middle of the night if I get into trouble, and you let me make the decisions. And I'm saying to myself, yeah, that's all stuff we can probably do for her. Never mind we don't, but we probably could. What should we do? Huh? How do we solve the problem? Which is that the healthcare system and the needs of the fragile elderly just don't meet up. Okay, here's the recipe. This is what I think we should do, and I think we're starting to do it, and I want to talk about that in a minute, too. Identify the sunshiners. I don't have any problem, and nobody in this room has any problem, knowing who's frail, irremediably dependent for activities of daily living. But ask the sunshiner questions. What do you think about the hospital? What do you think about medication? Is it more important to stay alive or is it more important to be comfortable? How do you feel about your, you know, those kinds of things. And not that we, we write down on the chart, uh, you know, ICD-9 25.6 sunshine, no. But you keep in your mind that these are the preferences of this person. I think we have to build trust as providers of health and well-being and care and rescue and all of those things with our frail elderly clients, patients, adults, residents, whatever you want to call them, and with their families. And there's only one way to build trust. That is to promise to take responsibility for these people and then keep the promise. You know, it's the old talk the talk, walk the walk kind of thing. No. I mean, you, you, you talk about patient-centered care, and then you yawn and go home again, and we carry on with business as usual. I mean, I, I don't mean to be critical of anybody. But if we promise to take responsibility for people, we need to keep that promise. And then we build trust. You know, then the caregivers believe us when we say, we will support you. It's okay to keep her at home. Have the tough conversations. Oh my God! Advanced directives. Oh dear. Um, you you've read Willie Malloy's "Let Me Decide," right? Um, I'm sorry, it's too complicated. I can't get through it. I can't ask all those questions. Um, the the left kidney is functioning. The right kidney is in kidney failure. Um, I fall and I fracture my left hip, what do we do? You know, that kind of detail. 
As far as I'm concerned, I want the answer to two questions. Just me. I want the answer to two questions from a frail elderly person. If I'm forced to decide between comfort and prolonging life, what's your choice? I studied this in a pseudo-academic way when I was into that kind of thing 20 years ago. 19 out of 20 people chose comfort. Maybe it was the way I couched the questions, I don't know. But that was the preference. But it's individual. And there's no way I'm going to be providing comfort and withholding aggressive care from that 20th person. You know, you ask them what they want. And secondly, who's the substituted decision maker? You know, if you've had a stroke and you can't tell me what you want me to do, or you're in delirium and you can't communicate, who do I ask? My daughter, Joni. Joni, I write down, substituted decision maker. Yes, you can have a representation agreement and you can do all the legal stuff. I just need to know what the person prefers. Caregiving. Um, gee, it's difficult. I have had, I had two parents. They both died relatively young and they were never frail. My wife's parents are now both frail. It's like when I was uh, about a third year GP, I had done obstetrics for three years, delivering babies, you know, and then we had a child. <laughs> Holy smoke, I found out what obstetrics was all about. <laughs> and I was never the same. And here I am, late, and I tell you, late in my career, I'm finally finding out what it means to be a caregiver and to have to deal with all those weird, difficult issues. And I think there has to be a contract. Now, I don't mean a, a contract like a lawyer would draw up. I'm just saying you've got to make some kind of a deal with a frail elderly person as a caregiver, which consists of the answers to questions like, what do I have to do? What do I have to give up? What kind of sacrifices do I have to make? Is it OK to pay somebody to help you? When do you want to go to a nurse? You know, those kinds of things. Um, and of course, if the elderly person is cognitively impaired, then it's a particularly difficult conversation because it's a conversation with yourself. You know. I don't think we can do care of frailty in an office. I don't think we can do care of frailty in a community health center. I don't think we can do it in some kind of a clinic that exists out of the side of a hospital. I think we have to do it at home. Oh, it's absolutely critical. And for goodness sake, it's common sense. A person can't get out of the house. You go and see them at the house. Specialists are valuable. We all know that. In, in nursing and in medicine and in physiotherapy and in pharmacy, specialists are wonderful, but they are not the people to do main care of frailty. It is primary care. GPs, home care nurses, the best, oh, I don't know if I should make this statement in front of this audience, but in my opinion, the best home care and facility nurses are people with some critical care experience who are not freaked out by chest pain and bleeding and breathlessness and so forth. You know, we have to be good at what we do and we have to cover the waterfront of primary care. It has to be a team. I can't do the care of any frail elderly patient at home all by myself. I need to work with and to be told what to do by, and when I say that to a medical audience, they all roll their eyes, a nurse, you know? We, we have in a program I will describe in a moment if I have the time, what we call nurse case managers. And they're dynamite, you know? And, and what, do, what do doctors do, you know? We're, we're not, as far as I'm concerned, the appropriate team leader. What I want is somebody who understands the global picture to say, breathlessness, go, fix. And I go and do it, because that's what I can do. That's what I'm trained to do. We need a team. Rehab, social work or the social work function, pharmacy or the pharmacy function, maybe nutrition, maybe legal advice, whatever it is. And of course, at the center of the team is the client and the family. Client-centered care, right? This may be the most critical thing of all. 
because crisis in frailty doesn't happen at 3 o'clock on Tuesday afternoon. It happens at 3 o'clock on Sunday afternoon or in the middle of the night on a Tuesday. So that care, okay, that live voice on the telephone, and I would say now to get back at you all, a nurse should receive the call in the middle of the night. And if, not, and if necessary, he or she goes to the bedside at home to find out what's wrong. And if necessary, he or she calls the doctor. And if necessary, he or she comes to the, the home. And as far as I'm concerned, those two capable, experienced, informed professionals at the bedside, in the home, beats the hell out of any emergency room in the country. We're frail. When a frail elderly person collapses, we have to support them. Maybe it's the flu, there's this sudden deterioration in ADL, we need to put home support in, and that has to be flexible. Uh, I don't know how many administrators there are here. It, it just, it makes me roll my eyes, or it used to make me roll my eyes, until I got involved with this system we're setting up at VGH, which again, I will tell you about in a moment. Administrators have got to start pulling things together, and so we have to integrate the home care, we have to integrate the hospital, we have to integrate rehab, we have to integrate the medical piece, and all of that kind of stuff. It's all got to be together in some kind of a database, and we've all got to understand what the others are doing, so get rid of the silos. It's about changing the mindset. It's about convincing people that hospital is the wrong place to go in crisis, it's to talk about preventive medication, whether you want to take it or not, it's doing primary care at home, and it's integration and responsibility. Before I tell you about uh, the program at BGH, I Imagine that you've thought that the last 45 minutes has been about improving care of the frail elderly. No, in reality, it's been a commercial for Dr. Sloan's book. 